Okay, welcome back everyone to Grocket's live broadcast of the GMAT edition of our OG TV show. We're going through the 12th edition of the official guide to the test. And when we left off last time, I think, let's see, so I caught up to where we were supposed to be with the published uh, schedule of questions. We are now on page 283. Oh, I should probably turn the pen on. We're on page 283. And we're at the top of page 283, number 114. That's as far as we got. And so my name is Jim Jacobson, and I will be working through some data sufficiency questions with you today. So that number 283, number 114, as always, since it is data sufficiency, and I don't assume everyone is tuning in to every broadcast, I write down the side the reminder of what each of the answer choices stand for. Um, a, one stands for statement one alone is sufficient, two stands for statement two alone is sufficient, T stands for together they are sufficient but individually insufficient, E stands for either, either one is sufficient, and N stands for neither, neither one is sufficient in conjunction or individually. So without further ado, number 114. <clears throat> The length of the edging that surrounds circular garden K is one half the length of the edging that surrounds circular garden G. What is the area of garden K? Assume that the edging has negligible width. So we have two gardens. Um, and they're both circular. One is K and one is G. We find out that the length of the edging around K is one half of the length of the edging that surrounds G. So the thing to remember about edging, edging is the perimeter of the circle. And you'll remember that the perimeter formula is 2 times pi times r or pi times the diameter. If we can figure out either of these bits of information for um, K or for G because we know that G or we know that K is half of G, uh, we will be able to find that distance around K. Or conversely, if we get G, we can also figure it out. Let's see what the statements give us. Statement one: the area of G is 25 pi square meters. Area of G equals 25 pi. You may, you may remember that the area formula for a circle is uh, pi times the radius squared. So in this particular case, pi times the radius squared equals 25 pi. Therefore, r squared equals 25 and r equals 5 for G. But remember um, that once we have the radius or the diameter of G, uh, we can then figure out what its perimeter is and take half of that, and that is the perimeter of K. So, you know, this would be uh, 10 pi would be the perimeter. And therefore, half of that 5 pi would be the perimeter of K. So statement 1 is sufficient. We can cross off B, C, and E. Statement number two, the edging around G is 10 pi meters long. Well, so that's the perimeter. And again, we have to kind of pretend we didn't just figure this out, but it is comforting to know that the thing we just figured out, that the perimeter was 10 pi, is then what appears in statement two, because it means we're on the right track. So the perimeter is 10 pi. Um, we know that the perimeter of K is half the perimeter of G, so this one is also sufficient to tell us that the perimeter of k is also 5 pi. So either statement is sufficient on its own. A good start. I don't know why I, I feel good when statements are sufficient. I mean, it shouldn't matter. It should just matter that it's the correct answer. But I would rather have the statements be sufficient, I guess because I get to figure out the problem the rest of the way or know that I could. Maybe a little bit more information about me than you actually needed. Anyway, page 283, question number 115. So for any integers x and y, uh, minimum x comma y and max x comma y denote the minimum and the maximum of x and y respectively. For example, the minimum of 5 and 2 equals 2, and the max of 5 and 2 equals 5. 
For the integer d w, what is the value of the minimum of 10 and w? So again, what this question is asking is what is the smaller of the two numbers in the parentheses? That's what this min function means. So um, if, uh, if w is, uh, let's get w in there, if, if w is greater than 10, um, if w is uh, greater than or equal to 10, um, the minimum is going to be 10. If w is less than 10, the, the minimum will equal w. So the big question is, 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 whoa, is w greater than or equal to 10? Because then that would be the, that would tell us that 10 is the minimum of those two numbers. So we need something to tell us about w in the statements. Statement one tells us that w is the max of 20 or z. And I have to tell you, I remember when I first saw this problem way back when I was looking through the official guide, you know, I saw this and I thought, Z, how, how can we possibly solve this? They gave us another variable. This is terrible. Um, it took me a little bit of thinking about this, actually. So uh, there's, I, I probably shouldn't admit that I have to think about things, that all this doesn't come immediately naturally on every single question. Um, but in this one, I really had to think about it. And then, of course, it struck me that it's obvious. So if, if w is the bigger of the two of these, if 20 is bigger, then uh, w equals 20. And if z is bigger, um, w equals z, and that in turn means that w is even bigger than 20. So either way, if w is 20 or w is greater than 20, either way, that definitely answers the question whether w is greater than or equal to 10. As long as w is bigger than 10, and here it's either 20 or bigger than 20, um, the minimum of 10 and w is going to be 10. So this is sufficient um, to, to answer the question. So it doesn't matter that z is in there. It just matters that 20 is big. <laughs> so uh, statement one is sufficient. We can cross off b, c, and e. Statement two, um, the max of w equals the max of 10 and w. So basically, in this case, um, this means that w is at least 10. So um, if, let's say, if w is less than 10, then w equals 10, because <laughs> w you know, is the max of those two things. If w equals 10, um, well, so let's do this make a chart. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a chart. That'll be better. Um, no. There we go. So if w is less than 10, the minimum of 10 and w is 10. If w equals 10, the minimum of 10 and w is 10. If w is greater than 10, the minimum of 10 and w is still 10. So um, no matter what w is in statement two, it tells us that the minimum for the original question is definitely 10. So this one is also sufficient. We can circle uh, or select answer choice D and cross off A. Two eighty three, number uh, one sixteen. During a six-day local trade show, the least number of people registered on, in a single day was 80. So we have six days, um, 
each are 80 or more. Was the average, or arithmetic mean, number of people registered per day for the six days greater than 90? Um, average greater than 90? Good question. So if the average was greater than 90 for six days, that means, or, you know, if it's, let's just say the average was exactly 90 for six days. Um, even though that average number doesn't need to have appeared each day, we can figure out what the total number of attendees would have been by um, multiplying this out. So six times 90, the total trade fair attendees would have been, you know, uh, is the total more than 540 because then the average would be over 90. So with each day being 80 or more, uh, all we have at the minimum here is 6 times 80 equals 480. So we know that there are four, uh, we know that at least 480 people showed up. The question is, did at least 540 people show up? Let's take a look at the statements. For the four days with the greatest number of people registered, the average or arithmetic mean number registered per day was 100. So for four days, there were 100 people each. Well, th there may have been more than 100 some days and less than 100 the others. But since the average was 100, it amounts to the same thing. 4 times 100 equals 400. So the question is, do the remaining days put us over 540? There are two days left, and we know from the original problem that each day still had at least 80 people. So we had two days at 80, that equals 160, the total equals 560. And remember the question over here was, is the total, I want it red, is the total greater than 540? Here we know that the total was at least 560, so this is sufficient to tell us um, yes, the average for the total, total daily average for the trade show would have been more than 90. So we can cross off B, C, and E. Statement two. For the three days with the smallest number of people registered, the average or arithmetic mean number registered per day was 85. We can do kind of the same thing. So three days were at 85, which equals 255. So then the question is, did the total come out to be more than 540? Well, we know that, um, and so those were the days with fewer people. So, you know, we know that the remaining three days would have been at least 86 each on average, but that doesn't get us over 540. We actually need to have something more like, you know, in the hundreds up here. So without knowing what the rest of the days are, we, we can come up with numbers, you know, we can come up with numbers where uh, it, the answer is no or where the answer is yes, if we make the numbers of people on the other days, the other three days of the six-day trade show, if we make them small, the answer is no. If we make them large, the answer is yes. So since it's sometimes yes, sometimes no, or it depends, statement two is insufficient. Answer choice A is the correct one. Two eighty three number one seventeen. I kind of want to. Well, I'll get rid of that little thing in a sec. Okay. In the figure above, points A, B, C, D, and E lie on a line. A is in both circles. B is the center of the smaller circle. C is the center of the larger circle, and D is on the smaller circle, and E is on the larger circle. What is the area of the region inside the larger circle and outside the smaller circle? Wow, okay. So, um, picture time. And then we want something like this. Wow, that turned out pretty good. Okay, so if I do say so myself. Um, we have A and E. B is the middle of this circle, C is the middle of the big circle, and then D is this point here. Is it B? Okay. So, and what it's asking for is um, the amount of this 
kind of green of the green area, the area inside the bigger circle but outside the smaller circle. So um, what that means is we would we would subtract the area of the larger circle from we would subtract the area of the smaller circle from the area of the larger circle. The area of any circle area of a circle equals pi times the radius squared. So we would subtract the um, so that would be basically uh, the area of the larger circle is the radius is either AC or CE. So it would be pi times AC squared or uh, CE squared minus, um, and then the smaller circle would be pi times AB squared, or pi times uh, BD, because each of these is, is the radius. And these could mix and match, so it could be AC minus BD or whatever. Anyway, so if we subtract these two areas from each other, we will know the area of the kind of green stuff that I just put in there. So in order to solve this, we need some of these values. So statement one, um, tells us that AB equals 3 and BC equals 2. Well, AB, we, we are reminded, um, is one of the things we needed. So now we need something that enables us to figure out what the radius of the larger circle is. Um, and in this particular case, um, AC, which is the other one we can figure out here is the same. So we have AB plus BC equals AC, which is the radius of the larger circle. So we were given AB, one of the things we needed, and we can figure out AC. So this is 3 plus 2 equals 5. Um, we were, given, we were given basically two of the things that we needed to solve this one. So statement one is sufficient. We can uh, cross off B, C, and E. Big question is statement two. Statement two tells us that CD equals one and DE equals, let's say DE equals a four. So we do have CE here and now we need to figure out whether we have the other portion which is the radius of the smaller circle. Um, so we do know um, that AD plus DE equals the radius of the larger circle. So even though that's not two radiuses, the two of them together equal the diameter. So we have um, AD plus DE equal the diameter. Um, which is two times the radius of the larger circle. AD plus DE equals uh, two times the radius of the larger circle. So uh, we use big R for the larger circle. We also know then um, that AD is going to be twice the radius of the smaller circle because that's the uh, diameter of the smaller circle. So um, AD also equals, uh, this is the diameter of the large circle. This one equals the diameter of the small circle. So AD itself equals two times the radius of the small circle. So two times the radius of the small circle, AD plus um, DE equals two times the radius of the larger circle. And we know from the problem that DE over here is 4, so this is actually 2r plus, 
Oops, lost track. What I was doing. Two r plus four. Uh, and we also know um, that, and I, I didn't put this on here, uh, CE, which is the actual radius of the circle, uh, the larger circle, CE is the same thing as CD plus DE. So the radius of the larger circle here is the two numbers we got, um, which equals 5. So... Um, so 2 times that is the radius, so that equals 10. So we have 2r plus 4 equals 10, um, 2r equals 6, and the radius of the smaller circle equals 3. From the rest of this, then, we can figure out, um, we already had the CE for the first part, and the radius of the smaller circle is this thing that we were after here. Now we have enough to solve um, the original question. So there's a lot of fooling around with the diameters of the two circles and then figuring it out from there. So yeah, I think I might have made that a little bit more confusing than I needed to be, but basically we're, we're tracking the two diameters, one of which we are given in the original in, in statement two by adding the two numbers together, and then from that we can figure out the um, radius of the smaller circle. Okay. Moving on. Actually, first I want to try and get rid of that thing. Ugh, there we go. Okay. Second column on page 283. Question number 118. An employee is paid 1.5 times the regular hourly rate for each hour worked in excess of 40 hours per week, excluding Sunday, and two times the regular hourly rate for each hour worked on Sunday. How much was the employee paid last week? So, um, so uh, hours over 40, not Sunday. They are at time and a half. Hours greater than 40 on Sunday. Our double time. Okay, so uh, in order to figure out how much the employee was paid last week, we need to know the number of hours and which days the employee worked. Statement one, the employee's regularly, uh, regular hourly rate is $10. So X equals 10. But without knowing the number of hours or which days the employee worked, there's no way this is sufficient. So that's insufficient. It's not A, and it's not D. Statement two. Last week, the employee worked a total of 54 hours, but did not work more than eight hours on any day. Okay. So, of course, the, the employee works uh, the regular, regular hourly rate, um, and... Um, but of course, without knowing which days the employee worked on, the employee could have worked eight hours on Sunday or could have worked, um, I guess the largest number of hours the employee could have worked is eight hours on Sunday um, and then, what, 46 hours uh, other days. So it would have been eight hours at um, double time and then uh, six hours at time and a half for the hour, additional hours over 40. Alternatively, the employee could have worked as many hours as possible on non-overtime days. So the first 40 hours would be, um, basically these would be reversed. The employee could have worked um, eight hours on Saturday and then six hours on Sunday. So without knowing which day the employee worked on, um, so this is Sunday and this is Saturday. It doesn't have to have been Saturday, just a non-Sunday day beyond the 40 hours. Um, I'll just pick on the weekend because it's easier to make it clearer. These could just as easily be reversed and that totally changes the amount of money the employee made. So without knowing which day um, the employee 
worked on, that's fine. And also, statement two alone doesn't give us the actual hour, hourly rate, so there's no way it could be sufficient. So it's not statement two on its own. In conjunction, we do have the hourly rate from statement one and the number of hours worked from statement two, but we still don't know whether the employee worked uh, more on Sunday or on Saturday, and that really does affect the hourly rate. It's the difference of $5 an hour um, because the employee would make um, $15 an hour on Saturday and $20 an hour on Sunday. So even in conjunction, the two statements are insufficient. Oops. And it is answer choice E that is correct. And number 119, 283, number 119. What was the revenue that a theater received from the sale of 400 tickets, some of which were sold at the full price and the remainder of which were sold at a reduced price? 400 tickets, some at regular, some at reduced. So basically in order to figure out what the revenue was, we need the uh, prices and the numbers of tickets in uh, each category in the regular or reduced. Actually, one or the other would be enough. If we knew how many regular tickets were sold, then 400 minus the regular would be the reduced and vice versa. So those are the two things we need for our revenue. Statement two, or statement one, which is the second step of doing. Okay, yes, wow. So statement one, the number of tickets sold at the full price was one quarter of the number of, to of the tickets sold. So, um, Let's make it full so that it starts off with a different letter. So um, full was one quarter of it. So that's 50 tickets sold at full price, which means the reduced ones um, were 150 tickets. But without knowing the prices of those respective tickets, full price and reduced, we have no idea what the revenue is. So statement one is not sufficient, and uh, D also has to be eliminated. Statement two, the full price of a ticket uh, was $25. Okay, so knowing the full price of a ticket, we don't know how many full price tickets were sold, and we also don't know how many reduced ticket prices were sold. We don't know the reduced tickets, prices, or numbers. So just knowing this is insufficient also. So statement two is not enough. In conjunction, we know how much revenue the they'll have made off of the full price tickets, but we still don't know the reduced ticket price. And without that information, we cannot compute the total revenue because we have to multiply these 150 tickets times that reduced ticket price, which we don't have. So even in conjunction, the two statements remain insufficient. Answer choice E. The annual rent collected by a corporation from a certain building was X percent more in 1998 than in 1997, and Y percent less in 1999 than in 1998. Was the annual rent collected by the corporation from the building more in 1999 than in 1997? So we have three years here. We have 1997, 1998, and 1999. And between um, 1997 and 1998, it went up X percent. And between 1998 and 1999, it went down Y percent. So the question is, is um, 1999's rent greater than 1997? And of course, it's immediately apparent that that probably depends on what X and Y are. Um, you know, if it goes up 1% and then down 300% or something like that um, to the point where they're paying people to live there, then no, 1999 won't be greater. Whereas if X is much larger than Y, then clearly the rent will be greater. 
Let's take a look at the statements and see what we get. So statement one, x is greater than y. That's a good start because in order for 1999 to be greater than 1997, the percentage for x does need to be um, larger than y, but it does actually need to be um, quite a bit larger, it turns out. Because for example, let's just say that it goes up um, 200% and then down uh, 1%. And let's just say the initial value was 100, because then it's easier to figure up. If it goes up 200%, it goes up to 300, which is huge. Um, and then if it goes down 1%, it goes down 3, so then it's you know down to 297. So with x much larger than y, the answer is clearly yes. Um, let's say it goes up 100% and then down 90%. So again, starting with 100, up 100%, it goes up to 200. 90% of 200 is 180, and it goes down to 20. So x being larger than y, so even though both of these are true, that x is larger than y, x has to be some amount larger than y, a specific amount larger than y, in order for this to always be true. So depending on what we choose for x and y, um, it affects whether 1999 is greater than 1997, so statement 1 is insufficient. We can cross off A and D. So statement 2 gives us um, x, y over 100 is less than x minus y. And this one's a little bit mystifying when you first look at it. Clearly we are looking at um, some kind of relationship between the two percents. So the two numbers, two percents multiplied times each other divided by 100 is somehow less than the straight up differences between the percents. But without knowing what this actually means, we actually can't make a decision. So we have to do a little bit of figuring. One of the things, I'm going to create some space here so I don't blur my um, explanations together. So remember that when the amount goes up um, x percent, we're, we're taking the amount and adding the amount that it goes up. Amount times x divided by 100, which is the same thing as the amount times 1 plus x over 100. And then when we figure when we are having that go when something goes down by y percent, it's very similar. Um, that ends up being the amount times 1 minus y over 100. And in order to figure out it going up and then down by that amount, we would actually multiply the two together because we basically are multiplying, compounding the effect of the interest going up and down. So that ends up being the amount first goes up and then it goes down. So we have an x minus y in here and we have um, some, you know, um, we have some 100s in the denominator, and that's starting to look more like this. So, but that's still not quite what we need. So we need to make this thing over here look more like the formula for what's actually going on. So the first thing we want to do is get a common denominator, um, or at least get all of them with denominators. So we divide both sides by 100 to get this side here um, over 100. So that it ends up being um, xy over 10,000 is less than x over 100 minus y over 100. And then we want to get the whole thing on one side of the equation. So we can subtract um, uh, x, um, Subtract x, y over one over ten thousand from both sides. Um, so 
um, oh yeah, right, sorry. So um, spaced out for a second. Uh, X over 100 minus Y over 100 minus XY over 10,000 is greater than uh, zero. And we can add a one to both sides. So we end up get, getting um, one plus x over 100 minus y over 100 minus xy over 10,000. That's uh, greater than one. Oh, sorry. So, um, uh, right. Well, let's keep going. So then the next thing to notice here is that we have um, Basically, this part here is what happens when, if you were to multiply x plus y times x minus z. So we're kind of factoring out um, what, factoring this out into two discrete expressions. So this this long thing here, x squared can be our our one because one times one is going to be one. So to factor this guy out, we end up with um, 1 plus x over 100 times 1 minus y over 100 is greater than 1. Which looks a lot like, you know, some of our original expression here. And the important thing to note here is that um, 1 uh, is what our original amount was. So the, so 1 here in each of our expressions up here is a stand-in for the original amount. And so here, this is basically saying that the interest of all of these together, going up by x percent and down by y percent, is larger than the original amount, which was one, one times the original amount. So it's sufficient. To, so statement two, despite all this figuring, um, or because of all this figuring, we can determine that it is sufficient for us to answer the question. Uh, the increase and decrease in um, so we were comparing it to the original amount, and it is in fact greater than the original amount. So if we divided both sides by amount here, we would have had this compared to 1. And here it turns out that it is greater. So uh, answer choice B on its own is sufficient. Tricky one. Okay, let's see, 283, um, number 121. So in the xy plane, region R consists of all the points x and y such that 2x plus 3y is less than or equal to 6. is the point R S in region R. So statement one gives us three R plus two S equals six. So we have basically then two different points where we can get three R plus two X equals six or you know more than one point. So um, if R equals two, so if we have two zero, three times two equals six, two times zero equals zero, so this is one pair of points that works. Um, we also have 3 times 0, uh, where r is 0 and s is 3. And that also equals 6. However, when we plug these points back into the original equation, um, this ends up being you know, 2 times x is 4, 0 times 3 is 0, plus 0. That is less than or equal to 6. Yes. Um, 2 times 0 is 0, plus 3 times 3 is 9, um, is less than or equal to 6? No. So we can pick points that work for the equation in statement 1 that do not work for the original equation posted in the problem. With sometimes yes, sometimes no, the answer is insufficient. So it's not A and it's not D. Uh, statement 2 gives us that r is less than or equal to 3, and um, s is less than or equal to 2. Um, so, I mean, you know, we can do 
very similar sorts of things, we could say r equals 3 and s equals 2. If we plug those into the original equation, that ends up being 2 times x, which is 6, plus 3 times 2, which is 6, equals 12. 12 is not less than or equal to 6. No, it's not. Uh, however, if we choose r equals 0 and s equals 0, um, 0 plus 0 is less than or equal to 6. Yes. So again, sometimes yes, sometimes no with um, statement 2. So it's not b. The 2 in conjunction, we can still choose values uh, that do work uh, and don't work. So if we choose uh, 2, 0, the one that we had here, r is less than or equal to 3, s is less than or equal to 2, um, then uh, we know for a fact that it does work. We already established that that point works for both statements. If we choose um, 1 and 1.5, for example, um, r is less than 3, s is less than 2, um, but then this ends up being 3 and then uh, 2.5, and um, or 2 times 1.5 ends up being another 3, um, or sorry, 3 times 1.5, uh, it ends up being uh, not less than or equal to 6, so it ends up being no. So again, even in conjunction, sometimes yes, sometimes no uh, is insufficient. So answer choice E is the correct one. Two eighty three, number one twenty two. What is the volume of a certain rectangular solid? So We'll just draw a rectangular solid for the sake of clarity. All right, but we don't know anything about it. Statement one tells us that two adjacent faces have, have areas of 15 and 24, respectively. So it is possible. Uh, so basically what it means is they share um, one side. They share one side. Um, so the areas, and you know, we're assuming um, even uh, integer values, but that isn't even necessarily true. So they have 15 and 24, which could be uh, 3 times 5 and 3 times 8. And then they would share a side that is 3. We're missing the third side in any case, but it could also be 1 by 15 and 1 by 24, in which case they share a side that is side 1, and we still don't have the third side. So this is definitely insufficient. We cross off A and D. Statement two tells us that each of two opposite faces of the solid has area 40, um, which doesn't tell us anything. Ha knowing only one side, it could be you know 40 times 1, or 4 times uh, 10, um, or you know 8 times 5. No idea. Insufficient, it's not B. In conjunction, though, um, we actually can figure it out. So we need uh, uh, one side that's 8 by 5. And this side has a side that has an area of 40, which means it can't be either of these two sides that exist already. So we have to use 8. Um, whoa, why did I put the 8 there? The 8 should be there. Um, it needs the, the uh, information from statement 1 needs to mesh with the information from statement 2. Since um, 3 and 5, or since eight, 8 and 5 are two factors of 40 that actually mesh with two of the values we came up with here, it does seem that um, the third number in this case is going to be 3. So then this is the 8 by 3 side, this is the 5 by 3 side. Okay, this di it didn't work out uh, graphically, but and then this is the five by eight side. So in conjunction, the two statements are sufficient to figure out the volume of the rectangular solid. Together, they are sufficient. Answer choice C. 283, last one on page 283, question 123. And... 
Joanna bought only 15 cent stamps and 29 cent stamps. How many 15 cent stamps did she buy? So 15 times the number of those stamps plus 29 times the number of the other stamps equals something. Let's take a look at the statements. Statement 1 tells us she bought 440 worth of stamps. So that tells us 15x plus 29y equals 440. Um, and on, on the surface of it, it looks like that wouldn't be enough. But process of elimination does allow us to figure out some other information. Um, so because we have two variables in one equation. However, um, with something like 29 cents each, there's only so many ways that we can actually end up with a final digit of zero when we're doing multiples of 29. So in fact, only multiples of 5 times 29 will get us um, to a, a multiple of 5 in the remaining in the ones digit. So um, if she bought 5 29 cent stamps, that would be 145. Um, if she bought 10 um, 29 cent stamps, it would be uh, 290. And if she bought 15 29 cent stamps, it would be 435. We can cross off 435 because there's no way to get from 435 to 440 with a 15 cent stamp. So she didn't buy 15. There's only two choices. Let's see what happens when we subtract these from 440. So 440 minus 145 equals 295, which is not evenly divisible by 15. 440 minus 290 equals 150, which is evenly divisible by 15. So clearly, she bought 10 29 cent stamps, and in fact, 15 is even, or uh, is 10. 10 times 15 equals 150, so basically she bought 10 of each. So statement one is sufficient for us to answer the question. It's not B, C, or E. Statement two, she bought an equal number of 15 cent stamps and 29 cent stamps. So that's X equals Y. But without knowing how much she spent, we can't actually figure out uh, what the total is. If we, had a, we, if we had a total in statement two, we could figure out how many of these are, but she could have bought uh, one of each, she could have bought a hundred of each. Uh, so there's no total, and so we don't know how many she bought. No financial total. Uh, so statement two is insufficient. It is answer choice A. We turn the page to page 284, number 124. The table above shows the results of a survey of 100 voters who each responded favorable or unfavorable or not sure when asked about their impressions of candidate M and of candidate N, respectively. What was the number of voters who responded favorable to both candidates? So 40, 20, 40. Uh, this is for M. This is for N, 30, 45, 45. Okay, not much we can tell um, other than there is room for, um, with 100 people, we don't necessarily have to have had um, anyone respond favorably. Well, we, we probably do need to have some responded favorably to both, but we don't know how many. Um, so statement one, the number of voters who did not respond favorable to either candidate was 40. So 40, um, uh, so if uh, 40 did not choose anything in this box here, that means 60. 60 uh, did choose favorable to, for at least one. So if 60 did choose favor, so since there's 100 people total, um, 100 minus 40 equals 60, um, 60 people chose favorable for at least uh, one of the two candidates. But since there are 70 people listed here, 40 chose uh, M and 30 chose N, 70 people uh, 
or 70, 70 favorable votes minus 60 possible people, that means 10 people um, answered favorable to one to, to both candidates there because the number of people um, that were actually available is smaller than the number of people who show up in the votes. So statement one is sufficient. It's not B, C, or E. Statement two, the number of voters who responded unfavorable to both candidates was 10. So what that tells us, so we had um, 20 plus 35 equals 55 people responded unfa unfavorably, and we know that 10 did it for both. So that tells us that 45, um, 45 of them uh, chose unfavorable for only one. Now knowing how many chose unfavorable for only one does nothing for us in terms of figuring out the favorable side of things. So this here has nothing to do with that there. Uh, I mean, not nothing, it's, you know, uh, the same people responding to the survey. But knowing how many did both in here, knowing that there's 10 that did both in there, does not solve uh, for us the number that did both in this one. So there's, because there's no connection, um, we can't actually solve for it. So statement two is going to be insufficient. So it's not D, it is A. Page 284, question number 125. So if that little symbol represents one of the operations, addition, subtraction, and multiplication, is, um, that oper is K doing that operation on the quantity uh, L plus M equal to K doing that operation on L plus K doing that operation on M for all numbers K, L, and M. So um, is K to L, and I'll make it a capital L. No, that doesn't really matter. And of course, really, um, the only way that this can be true is if um, is is that equal to multiplication. So basically, once we know what operation this is of plus, minus, or um, multiplication, we can answer the question. Statement one. Um, K symbol one does not equal um, one symbol K for some numbers. Well, basically this tells us that uh, the operation being done is subtraction because uh, K times one, or yeah, is that a one? Yeah, it's a one. K times one does equal one times K um, and k plus 1 does equal uh, 1 plus k in all cases. So the other two operations that are options in this case um, do work for all numbers k, and so the only one that doesn't work, you know, k minus 1 is not going to equal 1 minus k in all circumstances. So statement 1 is sufficient, and it is not b, c, or e. Statement 2. Statement two basically tells us that that operation represents subtraction, which is the same thing we figured out, which is sufficient. So it's not A. Either statement on its own is sufficient. So 284, number 126. How many of the 60 cars sold last month by a certain dealer had neither power windows nor a stereo? Okay, so power windows, stereo, and it's 60 total. Overlapping sets, so some of these cars may have one or both or neither. And we actually want the number over here that have 
neither. And remember, um, with overlapping sets, the formula is a plus b minus both plus neither equals the total. And we know the total is 60. Okay, statement one. Of the 60 cars sold, 20 had a stereo, but not power windows. So in our Venn diagram here, stereo but not power windows goes here, 20. So that's good, but it doesn't get us this guy over here. So it's insufficient. It's not A, and it's not D. Statement two, of the 60 cars sold, 30 had both power windows and a stereo. So that gives us the both, but it still doesn't give us this. Insufficient. Uh, so it's not B. So the two in conjunction, we can fill in the information here, 20 and 30. So it tells us that the number that have power steering, um, the, the number that has power steering plus the number that has neither would be something like 10. But since we don't know which is which, we have two blanks to fill in with one number. We can't answer the question how many had neither of the two. So even in conjunction, the two statements are insufficient. It is answer choice E. Okay, last one, page 284, question number 127. In Jefferson School, 300 students study French or Spanish or both. If 100 of these students do not study French, how many of these students study both French and Spanish? Another question with overlapping sets. So we have French and Spanish and the total is 300. Total equals 300. We also know that 100 of the students do not study French. So they can't be in the F circle or in the both part. 100 are here. That's useful. And then the question is asking, um, how many study both? We're after this part here. Statement one tells us that of the 300 students, 60 do not study Spanish. So we get 100 do not study French. We find out from statement one that 60 do not study Spanish. That means that there's uh, 300 minus 100 minus 60, 140 that do both. That's the number we were after, so statement one is sufficient. So it's not B, C, or E. Statement two tells, that it tells us that a total of 240 of the students study Spanish. And again, we knew that 100 were here, and we know that 240 total study Spanish, so there must be 140 in the both category, because 140 plus 100 equals the 240 total that are in the Spanish like circle, bubble, whatever. So statement two is also sufficient. Answer choice D is the correct one. So that's that's enough for today. Um, looks like we're finishing right on time. Again, my name is Jim Jacobson. You've been watching Grocket.com. This is the GMAT, GMAT side of Grocket.com, and we're doing the official guide, cover to cover, question by question, 12th edition of the guide, as it says right there. Next time, we will pick up with question 128 on page 284. So I hope to see you there next time.